Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Um, we're going to get started. We're going to call the meeting um, to order. Um, and I'm just going to ask Dalia uh, if she could just take note of um, who is present at the at the meeting. This is the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation May 2023 meeting. So we will officially begin. Can you just acknowledge who's present in the room, please? Um, in the room is Chair Naya. Vice Chair Lane, Ex Officio Paticos, um, Commissioner Cooley, Commissioner Flores, yeah. Superin Superintendent Sis, here. Um, Commissioner Schleiser, and then did I miss oh, Commissioner Raymer? Raymer. Commissioner Raymer, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have no one on the Zoom as of yet. Um, so we'll uh, begin with the first item on the agenda, also the um, sorry, the, the public testimony. So just as a reminder, public testimony requests or written comments can be submitted up to 24 hours in advance of the meeting, um, and they can be sent uh, over to the, e the following email. It's seventh district dot office at gmail.com that again is seven with the th district dot office at gmail.com um Tadia, did we get any um public testimony uh comments or requests to speak at the meeting today no we did not okay let the record show that there were no registered public speakers um, I don't believe we have full quorum so we're not going to approve the the minutes um as of yet um, but we're going to go into the next um, item, which will be um, our working meeting for today. Oh, and just a, a quick note on the, the minutes. I know that you should have them in front of you. We're going to be uh, sending this um, virtual as well. We're hoping to be able to um, uh, approve the minutes from uh, last month and uh, this month at the next meeting. Okay. Um, so without further ado, we know that this is um, intended to be a working meeting uh, for um, uh, just to discuss the different um, items that the commission has um, had presentations on. So we're excited to be looking at um, where we're at with certain items and certain topics and ideas, and also uh, figuring out what are the next steps and recommendations that are gonna be coming out of the subcommittees. So thank you all for uh, joining us today and I will pass it over to our vice chair, uh, Lane, for further instruction. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Is this on? No. on. No. No. <laughs> Someone got wind of my ear. Uh, well, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To, I, I don't know. okay. Well, all right. Then I guess it probably suffices for our purposes, right? Um, so, uh, as you'll recall, we had a uh, meeting last December which was uh, essentially a committee of the whole where those working groups that had specific uh, progress to report on their various initiatives invited input from other commissioners. Uh, that proved to be a very successful activity and one that was encouraged that we repeat periodically and today is uh, a repeat of that approach. Uh, so, um, the uh, conversation is intended to be inviting and uh, rule free. Uh, so I'm going to I'm aware of three working groups uh, that have made significant progress on their subjects. And in each case, the hope is that we collectively will uh, have uh, available to present to the Cook County Board uh, specific ordinances or um, or resolutions that have teeth in them to actually drive positive social change. So in no particular order, I'm gonna invite uh, representatives of those three working groups to fill us in on what they've uh, accomplished, where they're at, uh, also what help they need, what input they would be seeking from other commissioners in furtherance of that objective. 
Um, so in no particular order, if I may, uh, Commissioner Cooley, uh, I'd like to uh, invite your report on what had been known as the Industrial Policy Working Group. And I think we are transitioning to a broader moniker for that working group, which I'll invite you to uh, identify. And if you could kind of tell us where you're at, where you hope to get, and how we can be most helpful to get you there, I will uh, uh, happily turn the floor over to you. So thank you. This working? No. We're, we're trying to get the, the person uh, that's helping us with technology okay, to cool. figure out the mics. All right. Uh, thank you. You could just project as of okay. while we fix yeah. it, then we'll we'll, we'll just project a little uh, bit just so that the. So I think we're talking about the name being public assets rather than. Uh, and it's hardly your call. Yeah. It's within your sound discretion to name or rename your working group. Yeah, because the framing is shifted from kind of broader industrial policy conversations, but some more, what are the missing? It's either narrowed or expanded depending on yeah. your perspective. For sure. yeah. um, but so we continue to have been exploring the concept of public banking, public ownership of grocers, housing, and other um, pharmacies, other kind of missing public, usually generally provided private ass, uh, resources in a community, but for the many reasons why um, there's been disinvestment in communities, um, trying to replicate through public means, how to um, bring those necessary and vital community-based assets into back into the communities. Um, and so trying to figure out, looking at a mix of precedents that are out there um, and trying to document those and think about how to apply those to the situation. Um, it looks like New York and LA also have past ordinances in the last few years around public banking, and they're in the process of trying to activate those now. Um, there are some much smaller examples of public grocers and had a brief conversation with Commissioner Flores about some opportunities about combining housing and retail, um, where they've had examples of Cook County economic. And if I may interrupt, we did have a presentation about uh, Electric vehicle charging stations, right? Which and, that, and now thinking about that as the locales. public asset, yeah, making sure that those um, EV charging would be equitably distributed in communities, particularly where they wouldn't have necessarily garages or other private assets where that would be taking place. So, how to figure out how to get that on the public um, way, um, which I guess would be a conversation about transportation and how to figure out that, and that there was an opportunity at the federal level for. The minutes. Um, there's an opportunity um, at the federal level for applying for getting EV charging stations. Um, and that grants due at the end of the month for figuring out who would a county partner be for that, who would, who would be pursuing that application um, potentially as part of that mix as well. So I think for us, for needing some support, um, it's just seeing how these different pieces could layer together. Um, really documenting the precedents that are out there and starting to move towards getting to kind of more of an actionable policy that makes sense at the county level. And so some of that could support is that through um, researchers, you know, whether that's graduate assistants, um, you know, know we have connections to University of Chicago, we've got several presenters, and, um, a friend and colleague of mine is also in the part of sociology um, that we could you know, I mentioned we could try to lean into them for trying to get some support to get some drafts in place um, on that level. But then there's also convening the relevant department to me in the near future who would have some influence and have some probably be in control or at least be a strong partner in this work. So economic development, certainly with transportation on the um, EV charger as well. So, um... Commissioner Cooley, I, I know that you have been working on a draft. Um, could you give us kind of a 20,000 foot view of how that draft is shaping up and what are the yeah, well, elements and what, what uh, more, most important, where do you see the, the areas that you need some support in filling in gaps? So right now it's mostly just kind of these high level bullets that was outlined just now. We're really starting to be like, so what would be, kind of, are we creating a task force that's through an ordinance or resolution 
that would then be tasked within the next year coming up with a solid plan of action um, and then you know bringing a precedence what would be some pilot sites how would we um, prototype this in the next year um, or is it and then that becomes something that then becomes an ordinance moving forward so I think that was kind of the breaking point in wanting to have some conversation about what would be the next best steps yeah, and I also should the relevant uh, agencies thank you I also should mention that uh Commissioner and I attended a meeting in New York the last couple of weeks, uh, identifying a number of different funding sources for such initiatives, but more broadly other initiatives as well. Perhaps, uh, Commissioner, would you be so kind as to speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as part of NALEO, the National Association of um, elect Leaders, Latino elected and appointee, um, individuals. So they do annual trainings around uh, different um, uh, topics that are relevant to different folks and, and different levels of government. Um, I was uh, very lucky to participate in their latest training that they did in New York, in which they talk about uh, just general infrastructure and different opportunities coming down the pipe um, with um, funding from the federal government. A lot of that came, and I know Sis is probably very familiar with a lot of these um, uh, in regards to everything from electrification um, to ensuring that you know our roads are in a good, good place. But what I found very interesting is like how to engage and build a, a strong infrastructure within the workforce, um, which is something that I had never thought about that angle. And it was uh, at the center of, um, of a lot of what we've actually been discussing here. Like, how do we ensure that, you know, the Chicago um, um, community colleges have uh, the relationships and are building that pipeline to ensure that um, anything that has to do with, for example, electrification, um, that you have the, the trades at the table and the individuals and in the workforce uh, fully um, prepared for all of the funding that's going to be coming down. Um, so they were able to share a lot of information regarding, you know, some of the recommendations. And of course, um, getting the funding is just part of that, right? It's just like the very first part, but everything else that comes after from the different companies that do get um, contracts with the different levels of government, um, making sure that there's equity in that, that there's equity in the training, um, and if there's any um, specialized traits that need to be created, how do we ensure that we are supporting that? Uh, so it was quite a great conversation. It was a two-day um, training that really talked about those resources, and I'd be more than happy to share that with, with the group. But it does go in line with a lot of the, the topics that we've been discussing um, and it's very relevant to what's happening in many, many places. But as a second largest county in the country, we definitely should try to model uh, that uh, the way to do it. So we're hoping that we could do it in one of these committees. That would be wonderful. Um, please. Um, and I can add a little bit. It's, it's a great direction to uh, that this committee and really trying to assess and research what are best practices, what's going on. I think across the board, we're trying to do that because we don't have to build from scratch. We see that other areas of the country are having success in certain areas. It's it's great to have some um, research or capacity to really explore these things. Uh, as we look at this, I think within the county, one of the things that we're balancing is being prescriptive about what areas we undertake and also balancing that with ensuring the voice of the community is embedded in our work and really listening to community folks because we don't want to be in there saying, okay, we know everything that, that are the issues in our community and we're going to say we're going to fix it this way, that way, that way. So one of the things that um, has risen most recently is really trying to pilot some of um, some of this work, in particular, utilizing some of the ARPA funding to expand on United United Way's neighborhood network model, 
because they have a model that has worked um, and quite a bit within the city of Chicago. They have many neighborhood networks all across the city and unfortunately not as a big a footprint within the suburbs. So what we will be doing is selecting my location in suburban Cook County to try to build those neighborhood networks. We are identifying community groups to partner with. It takes a bit longer. It's typically a three-year process to understand and really engage community members and take that journey along with community members to understand what those needs are. Because there won't be a one-size-fits-all. Some of those communities might identify banking institutions as, as a huge need. Others might find transportation investments might be an issue. So. I would love to partner in thinking about like using our research entity to help us balance out like what's happening, what's working across the nation, um, what are other models that we can sort of bring into those discussions, but also balancing it with thinking about and engaging communities in helping us figure out the direction and the needs within those communities. I don't know exactly what that means or what that journey looks like, but um, I think this committee and embracing some other research entities to help us in that assessment might be interesting. Because there isn't a one size fits all. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but um, I'm going to be very patient in trying to really expand on the footprint that United Way has built in the city. It's proven out to work within the city. And I think that there are already three locations in suburban Cook County, but I'd like to see more of that and really grounded in community and really trying to amplify the work that's going on in communities. I think so your point about like I think work. your point about engaging residents of communities in the process <laughs> rather than you know from the top down telling them what they need or what they want, you know that is exactly the right the right approach in my view is. You know, a collaborative approach, uh, not, not only including communities, but place making them the priority in terms of any decision making or recommendations that might come out of this. I think that's uh, I think that's very well said and critical. And I think something to tie everything that we're doing as a commission with that is the upcoming events that we have with Chicago Social Enterprise, because it is in a lot of these places the first time that they are convening and that they're talking about capacity building, discussion, collaboration. Um, so we'd love to, you know, loop you in in those conversations. So if like if somebody from the department or from United Way wants to tap in, because if we are trying to create those infrastructure and Mark has, has been helping out with those and um, we, we already have uh, three uh, elected officials for May, June and July throughout suburban Cook County that are really interested and they're willing they're already giving me dates. And so, I mean, I think the reality is that there's an interest there um, to build that community and to ensure that everybody, again, is collaborating and talking about it. So I think it, it ties it. Um, and it may not always fall in line with, with everything maybe that you're doing. But I think, again, the community building piece is really important. And it's part of um, one of the goals that that. The, those workshops are intended to do. What I would like to think about is how do we prioritize and sequence the work such that the research, the community engagement, the thought leadership, the structure, the design, you know, are kind of all brought in at the appropriate time. Because if we do it out of step, we're going to miss the real opportunity. So, and I would be very eager to learn your thinking about how how we should be considering that. Because I think we want to have community engagement. We want to perhaps convene community leaders or churches or policymakers or local nonprofits or others. Um, but we want to bring them in at the right time when we have something to share with them to test with them, uh, to engage them around. So I think we have to have some critical mass of you know what what are these um, potential po potential businesses 
that are lacking in disinvested communities um, where the private sector has fallen short and there's a, a, a market vacuum where the county can come in and either directly or in concert with any or all of those kinds of stakeholders create and launch and manage businesses that will lift up people, lift up families, lift up communities, you know, uh, and, and maybe this is about um, demonstration projects or pilot projects around this or that given um, value proposition. But I'd be, I'd be, I'm eager to learn how you would be suggesting we think about this. Yeah, I think, um... I think there isn't a right answer for each community because they will all be in different stages. Yeah. Um, and we've seen that. There are some communities that have more established community organizations and I think the process will be faster. There are some other communities where we're really going to be starting from just the ground up and trying to engage and inform and solidify what those working partnerships are. So what I can commit to is continuing to provide updates as we evolve in this work because this place-based model is something new to the county. Like really yeah. taking this type of approach and building through the community level versus us just providing grants. Exactly. I think that there will be an opportunity where we will be investing some of our county funding, but we want those requests to come from the ground. Yeah, and, and, and it seems to me to do it right. We have to uh, we have to essentially look at these as social enterprises where they, they need to be financially sustainable, albeit potentially with some subsidy, but they have to both generate revenue and measurable social impacts. And how and what those metrics look like would vary, it seems to me, depending upon the venture and potentially the context. So um, I'm a great believer that the way you start is by starting. Um, so do, do you have any, to put you on the spot a little bit, since you've been very generous with your, your thinking about this, you've obviously thought about it carefully. It, 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 how, how would you suggest we begin this process? Let's begin the process by convening some of my team members that have been working on it to sort of provide an update. Maybe at the next commission meeting, they can come and talk about our transforming places just to get everyone at the same level of where we see each of the communities that we're working on. And then we can start developing a plan. Yeah, I, actually, then we have speakers locked in for the next two meetings. However, I, I, I wouldn't want that to slow us down any. So maybe uh, the working group and yeah. anyone who would like to that was the, the email that was forwarded over to you regarding maybe different stakeholders, including Jessica Caffrey and others, where we can kind of, yes. we could do that and we could definitely pin down a date. Yeah. Why, 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 don't, why don't we do that if you're so kind? And, yeah. and Roger, if that makes sense to you. That'd be great. Yeah. And, and I, think, I, I think what we're talking about touches on the other working groups as well. And because, you know, ideally, to the extent we can kind of cross pollinate as we go, is to each of the working groups activities where we see the points of nexus, that should improve the outcome because we're uh, looping in greater intellectual firepower and experience and relationships and platforms. So I, I, I would, I, I, th I thank you for, for this. And I think this would be a very useful next step, which I would love to see happen. And I would offer to be helpful in any way I can to put that together. And, and, and I also would suggest that we take some time to think through an agenda for such a session, as well as what are the desired outcomes from such a session, so it doesn't just become spitballing. We have actually, you know, a, 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 a real goals to come out of the session which then can be pursued either by the working group, the working group in concert with nonprofits or community organizations or local policymakers or whatever, whatever the mix proves to be that is optimal based on what the conclusions of that session might, might be and what, what information might yield. I 
of that discussion. I think, um, I think the needs are great. There's a lot of gaps that need to be met. And I think internally, the county is really assessing where are those needs the greatest and where can we be most impacted? I will, I will throw out two other thoughts here. Uh, one is, and you've touched on this, but different communities are gonna have different needs and maybe even different um, orientation toward this whole conversation. So I, I think, you know, as, as we think through this, I wanna make sure that we cast a, a wide net, but at the same time, a manageable net, because if the point is to work toward proof of concept, let's find a pure play to start with where there is greater support, clearer need, um, and, and where the county is most likely to be able to add value to the situation. So that's one thing I identify. And the other is, since we're approaching a historic date, that is May 15th, 2023, um, it would be useful not necessarily on that day, but at some day, um, to look at ways to um, collaborate with the city of Chicago, given the new administration. And I know some of the folks in the new administration happen to have sat in this very room, I think in your desk. Yes, right. Um, <laughs> um, and maybe so honor that seat, it's like, it's like whoever gets to sit in Abraham Lincoln's uh, seat in the uh, this one gonna be legislature. On the whole thing. Yeah, I was going to say you can grab that nameplate. Well, it's probably your seat. Um, well, they said that that's the seat that Congressman Quigley Davis and Congressman Garcia sat in, and now Mayor-elect uh, Brandon Johnson. So it's a very lucky seat. <laughs> yeah, so Roger, we actually are counting on the lot, but you actually have the uh, kind of the um, the omen within your control here, <laughs> but I, but and 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 I met not only not only the mayor elect, but other, obviously other people who are going to be uh, in the thought leadership of the new administration, uh, with whom there are already pre existing relationships. This might be a very useful way for them to start uh, thinking about things the way we might suggest that they be framed. So I, I throw that into the hopper too, just to make this as complicated as possible. Um, <laughs> so I, I love the concept and the evolution of it so far that the working group has done. And, you know, it is an interesting use of the government's role to create new public assets and asset types and classes. Um, but my question is how, what's the thought or conversation of research been around transitioning that public asset to a community asset? so that it actually is owned by the community or um, gets transferred once that infrastructure is built. Because as we all know that sometimes there are good roles for government and sometimes there are bad. And there, there could be a case here in thinking about this as an entrepreneurship development opportunity if you're actually investing in the infrastructure that's normally hardest for communities to actually come up with itself. Commissioner Schleicher, you're right on the money. And in fact, when Commissioner Raymer gets to talk about her working group, you will see a direct connection to what you've just said and what they're working on. And it kind of reinforces the notion that the working groups are gonna find common grounds here. And I think you're, you're exactly right. I mean, you know, to the extent that the county can play a role in de-risking this and seeding it and getting it off to a healthy start, at what points do we wanna turn it over to communities and that in itself could mean lots of different things, but uh, I, I very much appreciate that input. I think it's very compatible with our mission as a commission to empower communities to become increasingly self-reliant. And uh, I think I think what you said is, is right on the money and I thank you for that. Yeah, yeah I think there's Before, that question. Oh, I'm sorry. Some conversations um, about what that would look like, what, what how much of the asset particularly around grocery retail, like making sure that when the, an operator leaves in certain communities, how does that not stay vacant or mm -hmm. become a hole in a shopping center? 
district and become much more of a drag rather than a benefit? And what would be the role of the county to, or city to own that property, hold it as a shell, and then keep the operators coming in and out of that? So the so the gap of the where the profit margins are, which tends to be one of the things that was being said is why they're not entering because they're assuming they're not going to be able to make the same profit margin they would on the north side if they were in other communities on the south and west side. So what is that increment of value that the county hold on to while makes, maintaining community asset and then trying to find community partners to do the operating? So thinking of that as a spectrum of things, yeah. I mean, it, is, it has to be a spectrum of things. And um, I was in a food meeting two weeks ago, and nobody wants to run the grocery store. It's the hardest business. Yeah. It's so needed. Like it is, but it's essential. almost impossible to run. And they and, and they can pay for it. So ex officio criticals had a comment earlier. I don't know if we yeah. we passed our <laughs> the topic. I'm sorry. So one of the things I get concerned about in we, we look at my institute in terms of how you build a relationship with the community is what's the power relationship. Peter, could you speak up a little bit? Sure. I was saying that one of the concerns that I have, or the, we address it through our own work against my institute is, is asking the question, what's the nature of the power relationship between the community and the, and the entities that are reaching out to the community? Um, and I've been married, I'll be married 50 years this month. And I've discovered that buying gifts for my wife, um, I often know what I, I often tell her what I think she should have, and I discover it's not what she wants. Um, and that that's sort of a version of mansplaining. Uh, and that you know I, I I know better than you. I'd like to have a conversation with you, or here's something to have, and you should appreciate it. And um, so there was a great study that was done. Um, by UIC, I think it was this last summer, what they identified as a critical problem for community organizations is that they lack, that oftentimes those organizations lack the resources for them to make up, to determine for themselves what it is that they need and want. That, you know, all too often what happens is that somebody will go in and say, well, let's have a hearing. And you have a bunch of people get up and talk, but there's, but it's not something that community as a whole has necessarily gotten around in, or frankly, has really researched, you know, and has determined for itself what it needs. So I would argue that one of the things that the county should look to do is actually invest in the capacity of these organizations so that when you, they do come to the table, they can have their own position that they develop on their own grounds without anybody telling them what to do. And that that's that is that is a real and and, and what the UIC study did was that they 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 talked to community organization community and they they said that that's what they need. Peter, could I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I think what you're describing is the fact that uh, governance within a community is itself disjointed. So how do you if if the county were to fund that capacity building within the county? Who, who does it give it to within the community? I don't know, I've been I've been bouncing around and so have you, Mark, over the years with various community groups and so forth. And, and a lot of times people just rise up and say we'd like to be able to work on this stuff. So so in your in in your thesis, you would then identify the community organization that seems to be prominent or most um, respected, or what would be the criteria? I think part of it is having a conversation with people within the community to 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 begin to sort of get some ideas put forward and then and then begin to bring resources to them. We had I had a, a one time I was a candidate that had QA and um, I was one of the finalists and the QA the Center for Urban Economic Development UIC <clears throat> and it, and QA's origins was pretty much in, in the direction I was describing. When um, when they when they established it, their idea was um, to be a be the be the think tank and the resource for neighborhood organizations, and that's essentially what I was proposing for QA. Yeah, and it wasn't an academic, you know, it was a choice between an academic and me, and one other person I didn't know, but you know, they chose to go the academic route and this sort of practitioner route. 
but the but the but the but the core of it is that um, it, it, the uh, you you know you can it's easy it's not too hard to identify who the activists are in the neighborhood and and begin to have a conversation with them and then begin to understand what kinds of resources what kinds of questions are they asking. And well, I think how, how is that different from what we're saying here? We're going to identify the activists. It sounds to be more like as you were saying, you know, we need to take stock of what the needs are. We need to understand. in collaboration with the community. Well, but how does the community know how to? I mean, for their, uh, if I could, there are a couple things. In fact, I've had conversations. We have Professor Vargas in here as well. And we were talking about those precisely those power dynamics within community organizations and 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 a lot of that hinges on who the larger governmental entity decides right. are the important entities which there you've got the community power dynamic shifted and that cbo if you will is now a proxy for the, the the real power. So what you have to do is you have to get un, underneath that some participatory engagement practices. And to your your point, you know I've I've seen in some of my own community participatory research is that leaders will emerge around topics that are in, important to them so you can't necessarily say oh oh that's the guy that we need to talk to they may be catalysts in the conversation but once certain topics and issues get a ferment bubbling if, if you will leaders will emerge as opposed to being appointed but you've got to create the holding space for that to happen. So that's one of the things I, I was reflecting on in terms of our working groups next. So, so well. let me ask you this, Gary, from your perspective, you know, following through on this, you know, threshold thought here, um, if we, if the commission were to convene a meeting within a given community, we can identify a community and have it as inclusive as possible, let the word go out. If you have an interest in exploring these kinds of opportunities within the community, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love you to participate. Does that self-selection process uh, help address the power dynamic issue? Not as a one-time event, no. You, you need a, a multiple set sequence of, of okay. engagement. IIT has done some really remarkable work in the design, design area, in the design of thinking. Mm -hmm. they, have a, they have a school on design. Yes. And one of the things that they do is, I've worked with somebody who, who was actually working in as her description of it, the slums of, of New Delhi. Mm -hmm. and, and they were trying to figure out how they can improve sort of the, the economic well-being of panhandlers. And what they did was they spent days observing panhandlers and and watching how the transactions were done. And they came up with a, some very simple solutions in terms of how where the panhandlers keep their money. But the point is, is that it was based on observation. It was based on understanding what you know, getting a sense of what the needs were mm. from the perspective of the people who were in, engaged in that transaction, in this case, panhandlers, and then begin together with the panhandlers to come up with some solutions. That's, that's a design approach um, that can translate to community economic development and other kinds of things. Okay. And so it's very much bubble up mm. as yeah. opposed to, you know, and, and I'm, this is not a knock on on, on Panhandlers? The, the current oh. mayor. <laughs> in, in the best Southwest, one of the big problems with the best Southwest, as, as I looked at it, is that the solutions were predetermined. Okay. And then they went to the right. community and they said, here's what we think should happen. What do you think? Yeah, no, I get it. 
All right, let's. I, I think on that point, the last thing I think that we'll say on this, um, we saw this happening during the census. Mind you, obviously, we're going through a pandemic, but I'm, I'm sure a bureau chief can, can attest to this. A lot of the, the good relationship and leadership that really came out of the census was so organic and natural, and it always wasn't aligned with the organizations that received funding from the federal, I mean, from the from the state, the county, or the city. So what we saw is that there were maybe one-off events, to your point, where it did kind of engage a little bit folks here and there, but let's face it, we just don't have enough funding to ensure that it continues to happen. And what I, what we saw in the dis, in in my district, but in the surrounding areas in the southwest side of Chicago and communities that uh, black and Latino and immigrant were that the community themselves identified that as an issue to invest their own time and resources so that they put together their time, their different things. And they were in turn really teaching a lot of the other organizations that were receiving funding on how to engage the community. And naturally, you did see a lot of leaders that were very non-traditional leaders in the community, but because they felt very strongly about this particular issue, it established a whole other organic type of leadership that then it was truly led by community. So I think, you know, in, in certain instances, um, that makes sense on how to how to do it. I do agree that it cannot be a one-off event. It needs to be full engagement and participation. And I think that hopefully at, at we get to that point where we're really engaging people and creating natural organic leaders in a lot of these, of these areas. I do see it as a very um, complex issue that may not be super easy for even this commission to handle um, just on our own. Um, because there's so many complexities to it. Um, and just because somebody cared about the census does not mean that they're going to care about an issue like this, right? You'll naturally see other type of leaders that are growing and that are kind of discussing uh, particular uh, things like, you know, food security or health care disparities and, and want to really lead on that. So I think that those are things that we definitely need to take into consideration as a commission. I think this conversation is very useful. And Roger, uh, I'm going to kind of uh, thank you and invite you to pick up the ball. I think we have a direction in mind here. So please keep us informed as you go. And I want to be helpful in any way I can. And I think uh, I think this is, has extraordinary potential, not only for the communities within the county, but in terms of leveraging thought leadership well beyond the county. So, so thank you very much. Um, and I think we should move on to the next working group. Um, so, Commissioner uh, Austin, uh, so you are leading the group, which is variously named as public safety, community wellness, um, uh, anti-recidivism, uh, crime reduction, call it what you will, is your baby. So please uh, fill us in on where you're at, and uh, Commissioner uh, uh DeBow, unfortunately, is not able to be with us for some family reasons, but uh, I know she's been working hard with you on this as well, but we would uh, we would uh, welcome your report. Sure, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to bring our report. Actually, she's been working hard, and I've been working with her. But uh, so it's I, smart. So I was <laughs> uh, about that, but we had originally planned to get a initial discussion meeting with uh, Cook County Health and Cook County Hospital Foundation. That was targeted for May. We have learned that that's now going to have to take place in, in June. Uh, but we will continue to march toward getting that set up and notify folks as quickly as, as we do and the results of it. And, and in between now and then, I also wanted to go back and begin to explore some of these then just concepts we were talking about with uh, Professor Vargas, because he has willingly agreed to help join this working group and others for the uh, commission here. And as a, a department that's willing to kind of get behind him with that and begin to explore some things about uh, participatory engagement to look at how we look at some of these community dynamics and unearth and, and, and kind of tackle and prioritize 
some of these, but some folks call the social determinants of health, other than social determinants of recidivism and various uh, other things, but really look at some of the uh, factors that I want to own and that build community well-being and, and, and wellness, however we define that, inclusive of public safety. So that's my next step is to get back to some of the resources he had committed to kind of stake out some ground and, and propose some priority approaches to do this and bring this back. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us that Professor Vargas had not only volunteered to serve this working group, but any other working group uh, that he might be helpful to. But beyond that, he also offered up his students, which I think may very well fit into uh, what the, um, Roger, what your group is gonna be doing. And I think those students are gonna be very relevant because they have sociological and data backgrounds. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, Harry, was apropos of um, kind of characterizing this as public safety, but also kind of community wellness. Um, uh, Jim Crown, who's the chair of the uh, Public Safety Task Force of the Civic, Civic Committee of, of the Commercial Club, spoke this week on public safety. And he was, uh, he is a C on a very uh, prominent Chicago family, as you may know. And he speaks for a large segment of the business community. And he was calling upon the business community to step up as to public safety issues. Uh, and he was focusing in particular on employment and infrastructure. So this may be some additional grist for your mill uh, because he sees uh, the corporate community's involvement as essential to uh, successfully addressing questions of public safety. So if we wanna reach out to Mr. Crown, that might be one possibility, but more broadly, uh, this, the commercial club has now heard that pitch mm -hmm. and uh, the membership of the commercial club are uh, obviously leading businesses within the city and therefore the county. Uh, and now I think are gonna be more receptive to the notion of their uh, contributing to uh, community wellness through the lens of public safety. So I, I, I commend that to your, for your consideration as well. Well, that's, that's excellent to hear because one of the things that uh, I find at least close to the home of my work with safer is on second chance hiring and talent development pipeline. There's often a lot of everybody wants to do it but not everybody wants everybody to know that they're doing it. So that creates an interesting dynamic in, in terms of trying to build a, a critical mass of folks getting behind the concept of uh, second chance talent pipeline development. Can you extend on that a bit about people who are doing it? Well, so we work with uh, a lot of employers yeah. who are happy to take our clients and employ them. They don't want it to be known that they're hiring people with records or, form, or formerly or formerly. Yeah. Employees are hiring them in services people. There's But when you, you know, so the, the challenge becomes when you want somebody to step out as a, as a champion yeah. Yeah. In, in that space, they could be doing it, but not, so not, like, not, not going to take the bullet pulpit on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I, I think the, the, the lesson here is this needs to be a multi stakeholder proposition. Absolutely. I mean, every element of society has a vested interest in improving public safety and community wellness, which go hand in hand. Uh, so let, let me ask you this, Harry, given kind of the spirit of today's session, are, are there areas that you would like to see some help with or support of other commissioners or the expertise of other commissioners? Well, certainly I've seen some parallels between the other working groups, particularly around things that deal with uh, 
as we said, public assets, the uh, economic development yeah. concept of uh, cooperative enterprise and things like that all to me represent some fertile ground in terms of intersectionality. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the other thing to, to think about is really about what um, being able to identify different types of uh, pressure points, for lack of a better word, where uh, we can exert some policies and practices that will en enable different facets of this multi-dimensional challenge. And, yeah. and, and that's the thing we ran up against. It's so big, where, where do you start? So we wanted to start with the violence and intervention emanating from a hospital partnerships, uh, and we still should, but there are other folks that would be like the next tier out in terms of tangential opportunities that I think we have to look at, but that's where the uh, voice of community should be raising up the thing. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, other speakers, at the, other speakers at the same commercial club meeting were encouraging greater support for violence interrupter type organizations but again, I would be remiss if I did not make the same observation to you that I've made before. And that is with the new administration at the city level, uh, to the extent we can identify counterparties who might be willing to collaborate with us on this initiative and other initiatives, uh, you know, the time is certainly right. I understand that the uh, person that has been selected to lead the police department has, he has decided not to uh, throw his head into the ring on a permanent basis. So that position continues to be open. Um, but I think they're obviously craving some support, some information, some approaches that will be innovative uh, to deal with this issue because uh, I, I needn't explain any further. That's it's clear to all of us, we live it. Um, but I think that the work that's being done by your working group and uh, the hospital and the hospital foundation, you know, it seems to me that that gives us a sufficient anchor here to reach out to city players that we might identify as uh, influential and interested in working with us to arrive at solutions that are bigger than the initial project we're focusing on, but also tap into the the broader uh, expertise of the commission and its commitment to drive positive social change. So I would, I would encourage that there be consideration of outreach to the city, and particularly in the immediate future as things are starting to take shape and leadership is being identified. I think that's a very timely um, a nexus for us to engage with them, if you agree. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the only other working group that has something to report, and I will be happily corrected if there are others, is the Community Investment Vehicle Working Group, uh, led by uh, Commissioner Raymer and Commissioner Freeman. So, Commissioner Raymer, would you be so kind as to share your uh, an update with us? Sure. Um, so, if you recall, um, the the first time we kind of began our discussion on community investment vehicles was last year. It was the presentation we had. Um, I think it was from the Community Investment Trust. Is that the organization who came in uh, yeah. and discussed mm -hmm. the, the concept of it um, and introduced it to the commission. And it's basically um, an initiative, a tool for communities to only invest in commercial properties or properties within their communities. And as we have you know, met in our uh, community group and have learned there's a million different ways to do this, a lot of different models, um, you know, it's a, a lot of small investments from the community or perhaps getting a few that do larger investments and then, you know, maintain the property or get the property built or whatever. So it's it's a world of opportunity. Um, 
Cook County does not have one to speak of at the moment. So we were very interested in trying to identify a pilot project and what that would look like. So we've been doing a lot of um, uh, research and discussions with um, various entities. Kristen Freeman, you know, is a living, walking, breathing community organizer and developer and really knows this type of world backwards and forwards. And um, our last committee meeting was a really good one. Um, we narrow, we, we're at the point where we have a potential pilot project to test out. And through our discussion, we really coalesced um, a policy recommendation um, that we would like to refine and move forward. What was discovered um, was that, you know, it centers kind of around the that old chestnut, the the land bank, the Cook County land bank, the opportunity there. And through the um, properties and everything in the land bank, a lot of it would be great. Let's have, you know, build those out and get those community owned and community built and use those as community investment vehicles. But as so many of us know, financing these projects is a big deal. It's very complex. And the Cook County Land Bank has a restrictive covenant. It's about $20,000, which for some projects isn't that terribly large, but for other projects, it's a significant amount of money. And so through our conversation, we're like, all right, well, let's, is this a law? Is this an ordinance? Is this something we can affect change on? Is this really necessary? Um, it's obviously in there for some kind of reason, maybe to avoid flipping or, or whatever. But if the project is for a community-based organization or for community investment and community ownership, is that a restriction to accessibility, to progress, to the ability for um, nonprofits and these types of uh, initiatives to really succeed? Just another complication. So um, we are going to be refining our uh, recommendation to see perhaps uh, to recommend that that restrictive covenant um, be not required for community investment vehicles or community-based uh, projects. And Mark's, you know, came in, well, for ones that are already in play, let's have those no, you know, I mean, if these really are um, an impediment to community development using this these particular assets that are controlled by the Cook County universe, is there some way that we can remove that obstacle and, and uh, speed them in the development of these vehicles? Um, the pilot project, um, we're still, you know, uh, discussing what that could look like, but um, what it is on the table right now to discuss is the um, Sankofa Wellness Village in West Garfield Park. Um, could that be, as it's being developed, part of that turning into um, a community investment vehicle embedded within the whole, you know, huge initiative that it is? So um, that's our update. Um, we hope to have a recommendation perhaps at the next commission meeting of what an ordinance could look like um, and what we could take to, to Cook County to perhaps, you know, um, change. Well, thank you, Wendy. And uh, to contextualize this to some degree, there is uh, legislation pending in the General Assembly. There were two overlapping bills, one proposed um, uh, by the, uh, Chicago Community Trust, the other by the county treasurer uh, to uh, reform the um, the uh, property tax sales system, which is, uh, in my view, misdirected and it denies homeowners, for example, the ability to retain their homes if they run into financial difficulties by virtue of unemployment or illness or otherwise. 
And it also has the effect of uh, encouraging private investors, even hedge funds, to pick up properties by gaming the system through what's called a sale and error. Um, and uh, clearly there needs to be some help to repurpose vacant or abandoned properties, get them back on the tax rolls. And the, um, the, the feature in the code as currently exists imposes upon buyers out of the land bank a $20,000 contingent obligation, which is um, satisfied by holding the property for two years. The intent is to ensure that, that we don't have a straw purchaser and that this is going to flip into the hands of some other buyer who was not really intended to benefit from the system. But uh, that has proven to be problematic for um, individuals and small organizations that uh, have difficulty securing financing on the property, for example, because of that liability that appears on their balance sheet, albeit a contingent liability. So the thought was if we were to have that not apply to um, uh, community organizations that are acquiring properties, they're not buying it for the purpose of flipping it, that's it's clear. And similarly, nonprofit organizations that is acquiring the property for their tax exempt purposes, uh, the, the $20,000 is only an impediment to them in terms of furthering their uh, cause and serves no public purpose. So the rationale is, is not justified by the way the uh, obligation is so broadly uh, um, um, applied by ordinance. So Wendy and Kristen are, are playing with what this might look like so that instead of having merely a, a demonstration project, we're actually starting to build some policies that drive the decisions by which uh, community investment vehicles can thrive and getting rid of that obligation it ought not apply to them because there's no rationale for it to apply to them strikes me as a reasonable step. It's a small step, but I think an important one. And it also signals from the county's perspective the importance of encouraging community investment vehicles. And uh, from a, a timing perspective, I understand that the, uh, the blended community trust county treasurer's uh, bills uh, will hit um, cleared the House uh, Revenue and Finance Committee last Thursday and is on track to uh, be approved by the House uh, before the month is out. So I think we're, we're, we're doing this at a time where policymakers are mindful of the, um, of the unfortunate and unintended consequences of the way the, uh, the property tax sale system is, is operated and how best to untangle it and make it work uh, optimally for the benefit of the communities that it seeks to serve. So Wendy, thank you for your for your efforts in this area and, and Kristen's as well. Again, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, anything we should be doing to loop in the city? And second question, take them in either sequence. Uh, other commissioners that you would like to kind of join the party uh, where their expertise, interest, experience might be useful to your working group and kind of advancing its cause. Well, we have uh, Patrick Brutus on our working group, which is really great. Yeah. Um, and he he lends that city viewpoint to us. Um, so that's that's been great. And you know, as far as the expertise, you know, um, you know, the to me, like the, the most amazing element of like any community project is that capital stack and the complexity of you know raising the money to build that building it's just astounding to me so you know somebody with that knowledge of of finance lending that background the complexities and just you know the you know ability to see in real time what are the roadblocks or the opportunities for us to um, even make more changes as we learn more about this initiative would be great. Um, another element that, you know, we're discussing is, yes, a, a policy 
um, recommendation and, and permanence that way, but also, you know, is there a fund that Cook County can set up to help foster these community investment vehicles? You know, if we can prove success, um, can we direct some funds? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to Commissioner and I on that question, but I would throw in my two cents as follows first, and that is mm -hmm. rather than starting with the fund, yeah. uh, there may be funds available to help launch a specific project as a proof of concept to start with. And then when you have something that is, can be used as a demonstration example of what you have in mind, then people understand it better and more inclined to be interested in investing in it. But Commissioner and I is the experts. Well, I mean, I would echo that. I think oftentimes we do pilot programs and we've done initiatives that um, are intended to to, to see if it works and to see if it is successful. I mean, the county is in a position where we've done things that we've never done before. I mean, we're getting rid of medical debt. I'm sure you all have heard it this week. I mean, we continue to do that and we, we're investing because we understand that it ensures that people in the communities that for whatever reason had medical debt um, need that financial freedom and it was not their fault, right? Um, <laughs> So things like that, I know Sochung has uh, ongoing uh, projects in her, in her bureau uh, of things that we have never done that we're ensuring that we're looking at as pilot programs and we're hoping to continue to fund that in the long run. I think um, the, 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 the lessons that I think the county has learned, especially um, under the Park Winkle administration and with a lot of other commissioners and great leaders um, in the different bureaus, has been that we need to look where um, we're actually investing and what we're funding um, and look at the long-term effects of it. Quick fixes have led us to be in a position in government where uh, we end up paying more down the, the road. I mean, when you talk about public safety, mental health, um, you know, uh, and, and, and even, I would even say even preventative healthcare and versus like emergency type of, of healthcare. We know that if you do, if you focus on preventative, if you focus on violence prevention and other initiatives and investments in community, um, the results are more efficient and they're more powerful and they're more meaningful to communities. Um, so I would never say no, um, obviously cannot make commitments right now, <laughs> uh, but it's something that I, I think, um, People there, are really open to. Is there, is there any guidance you could provide, um, you know, for a pilot project? What elements, you know, you really are looking for to be reflected in the plan or in the proposal or anything like that? I mean, I think I, I wouldn't, um, I don't have the ins and outs of all of it, right? I think that there's a lot of stakeholders that would need to be a part of that conversation, including the land, land bank, in my opinion, um, because. You, to your point, I mean, you, you talked a lot about how do we make sure that we're taking away barriers and if there if if that pilot program is to take away that barrier about financial um, uh, wall that has been put in, in, in people's uh, way that have, have not and communities that have not been able to kind of, you know, accomplish that I, I would say um, having those conversations and really dissecting the problem and understanding how to fix it is important. Um, oftentimes we, you know, we've talked about this even today, we think we know how to fix it, but we're not really 100%. Um, and it's always good to understand both the, the bureaucracy part of it and the internal govern, government part, but also like the community and making sure that both of the issues are very transparent. I mean, both sides are very transparent and understanding what those barriers are, um, I think is always something that has really been helpful for us um, uh, to, to, to understand both sides and to see you know, what, what does work, what doesn't. And obviously always looking at other jurisdictions if they've done something like that and using that as an example. Um, I think that those are all, and there, all there are examples around the country. The other thing I would add is be mindful of what you're solving for. Uh, what is you're trying to accomplish socially? And because from that will derive um, metrics to see how successful you were at driving social change um, you know, what is, what is the theory of social change behind it? Um, what, uh, what measure, what can you measure to establish that it has been successful? And if so, to what degree? 
and all of that should be kind of baked in the cake. Understand wh why you're doing what you're doing. You know, we like the idea of community investment. That's great. But, you know, there, there are gradations about how it really helps a community. It may, it may sound good, but actually not deliver on its promise. So I think you have to be very cautious in terms of design and design thinking around what is this and how do we, what is our expectation that we will achieve something that is going to lift up the community and obviously looking at precedents in other cities or other communities about what they saw in, in analogous situations and how they were able to construct a, a vehicle that actually drove social change and what lessons we might learn from that in the design of our pilot projects. And then those ingredients can be replicated in subsequent uh, community inve investment vehicles, you know, so, so if, if we're able to get this going and it actually, you know, realizes its potential as we hope it will. So, I mean, I, I think about it in that way as well, not just kind of uh, in a knee-jerk way, assuming if something is a community investment vehicle, it is thereby going to be good or good for whom and good in what way. So I mean, you have to be kind of granular in your thinking about what is it you're seeking to accomplish and how best to get there. And the final thing that I, I didn't mention, but I think it's important is how, what does the pilot program look like? Um, you know, how to formulate it, but also like how much will, will it cost? Because a lot of the times, like we, we that. <laughs> that's the big one, right? So I think um, um, oftentimes we, yeah. like I've been able to um, uh, propose pilot programs and they've been voted on um, during our budget process and, you know, that they've been successful but they're not like millions upon millions, right? So I think like I assume that a project, a pilot program like that may take that. So like, um, this is a great platform to kind of bounce ideas because it's like how maybe it is a very similar to the, the land bank. Land bank is private public partnership, yeah. right? So like, how do we look into, um, are there um, stakeholders in philanthropy that would wanna do something like this to prove concept, right? Are there people in the private sector that would want to, or entities in the private sector? Because I think once you get the buy-in from all, a lot of folks, it, it, it doesn't seem so daunting on the government side because you have other people and other stakeholders that are like backing a project that, again, the goal is to prove the concept and understand whether it's successful and meaningful. Um, so I would just say, obviously taking that into consideration and I'd be more than happy to be uh, a part of any conversation that well, you, you need me you, to be. You will be. Um, and, and by the way, just to throw in a plug for my part of the world, this lends itself to a tranche capital structure where different um, investors, whether non-dilutive philanthropic investors, all the way up to financial first uh, seeking market rate, risk adjusted market rate returns, and those in the middle seeking blended financial and social returns. This can appeal to all of them, giving each the benefit of its bargain because their bargains are different and then harmonize them and, 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 and then galvanize them around mission. So I think, I think this does a, a kind of encourage a tranched or layered capital structure. And we could talk about the outlandy because I think that's, I think that's really what we're talking about co-investments or philanthropic support or concessionary funding of some sort. I think all of that kind of has a place in these kinds of projects. Okay. I think we're done. <laughs> we're not quite done with all I'm of our done. projects, Your turn. but <laughs> Your turn. And, um, no, no, so I just thank you all for, for participating today. Um, uh, this is very um, informative uh, because it does, again, help us connect the different working groups and understand, you know, where people are at and if there have been any specific areas where we um, should provide additional support. Um, you know, we we want to make sure that we're that we're we're doing that um, in our capacity. And I know we only get to meet once a month, and a lot of the times, yes, the working groups sometimes meet, but oftentimes it's really difficult. So having working meetings like this are going to be really beneficial going forward. I know that we have um, uh, we're committed to ensuring that we provide these spaces. I know um, since the beginning, Vice Chair Lane um, said that you know. Since we did it in December, it seemed like it's very productive. Um, so we'll be following up if there's anything that you all um, need support with. Um, we're also going to send the group um, 
and the upcoming workshop dates um, for in the flyers of that. Um, we've had a, a challenge with the first one with, with a particular location. So we're trying to finalize la last details, but I just want to put it on your radar. It is May 25th, um, starting at 5 um, p.m. And it's going to be um, in the northern part um, near O'Hare. Um, I, again, we've had issues with, um, with the location, so I'll, I'll make sure that once it gets finalized, I believe that tomorrow it's the, the, they're letting us know by tomorrow, the, the entity, the municipal uh, building, um, we'll make sure the flyer gets out to you all if you want to participate in those. Um, and then we'll keep you in the loop on the other, um, workshops that we're going to be doing in, in different areas, um, of suburban Cook County in conjunction with. Um, Chicago uh, social, social enterprise. enterprise Chicago. Oh, social enterprise Chicago. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, those are again, we're going to be discussing a lot of the same issues, and they're going to be doing um, the workshops and capacity building. So anything else that you'd like to share yeah, about those? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. So um, the way this is shaping up, these are going to be targeted to nonprofit leaders. Obviously, anybody who's interested, welcome to come. Uh, but the idea is to encourage nonprofit leaders to look at their organization's core competencies and underutilized assets and thereby create uh, earned revenue strategies uh, to become less dependent upon philanthropy, less dependent upon government contracts and grants, become more self-sufficient, be good stewards of the resources entrusted to them. And uh, there are going to be two presenters, uh, Valerie Leonard being one. She, in fact, had been a member of this very commission and myself. And she's going to talk about the real stuff and I'm going to talk about the legal stuff. And uh, so it's going to be 90 minutes. Each of us will go for roughly 30 minutes. Then there will be Q&A for 30. Uh, there will, in each case, be a, a local policymaker who will be hosting the event along with the commission. And um, so we're hopeful that this will, this collaboration between the commission and Social Enterprise Chicago will help uh, drive greater self-reliance within the nonprofit community, uh, which we see as a shared objective of both the commission and Social Enterprise Chicago, which is a 501c3 organization. So you'll be hearing about those and uh, love to see you there. And beyond that, if you are aware of nonprofits whose management might benefit, whether executive directors or, or, or board members who might be interested, we'd, we'd love to have them there. We're gonna to try to do it scattered throughout the county over the course of the next uh, several months. So um, that's, that's the scoop. Great, um, nothing else on my end. I don't know if there are any um, final comments or um, announcements of any sort. I know that we have a, a, a ribbon cutting tomorrow. Do you want to make that announcement? That's really exciting. Thank you, Commissioner Mojardo, for joining us. I'm so sorry. I just like, had away from my dress to see what I'm mm -hmm. um, So Centro de Trabajos Unidos is an organization I co-founded 16 years ago. Uh, we focus on labor rights issues, immigration. We actually received a, a building from the county land bank in 2014 for a dollar. Yeah. $10 to the state of Chicago made us pay $9. <laughs> $10. <laughs> Um, and we had a grant under Governor Quinn. Unfortunately, we went through some issues with Rauner administration and we're not able to finish the construction. But last year, and actually, I would love to join the committee now that I'm officially back on. But um, we actually managed to get a capital grant for $1 million to start a construction again. Wonderful. Tomorrow we have ribbon cutting. Um, we'll we're running some issues with some permits for the um, the lift, um, but we'll have the open house eventually once the city gives us occupancy approval. So you're all welcome. 9805 South Ewing Avenue, which is the southeast side of Chicago, few blocks away from Indiana. It's um, going to be the first worker center facility in the entire southeast side and south suburbs as well. Congratulations. And so we actually incubate businesses, work cooperatives, um, and so the basement will be utilized for that. Our office space, and we're also going to, going to be housing temporary new year right immigrants um, in the second floor. And in the summer, once the city approves our vacant lot purchase, we're going to we're going to build a community garden with a greenhouse. And so, 
This is, but the ribbon cutting will happen tomorrow. So nine, eight years waiting, wow. actually. Mm -hmm. You're all welcome. Congratulations. We're very proud of uh, Commissioner and what has occurred. Congratulations. Um, any other announcements? Uh, no, yeah, quick sure uh, the Delta Institute, along with three other nonprofit partners, was awarded uh, US EPA region by the Environmental Finance Center. So, there's <laughs> communities in Cook County that need assistance in applying for state revolving loan funds, drinking water, or uh, clean water funds. We now have an organization in the region that can help them directly reject the process. Wow, well, so that's it's amazing. A huge, um, Opportunity for kids that don't normally get access to these funds to be able to get the help they need. Hey, Bill, thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, if there's flyers, if you can share that, we can um, make sure yeah, to disperse it to them. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Bill. Congratulations you. on that. Great. Okay, we're we're adjourned then. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Commissioner Raymer, second by Commissioner Alston. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those. Okay. Be We're well ready. and stay safe, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Alma. Thank you. Is she going to let me know tomorrow about this? <laughs> <laughs>